Good day, Dave. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this Skype video interview with me. Um, you and I have uh, met, we think, back at ISPI conferences in the day, but I think we've been connected on social media now for a little over 10 years. Um, and But for our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and work and what you do, and then perhaps some of the more interesting things you've worked on in your career. All right, sure. I'm Dave Ferguson, and I'm here in Victoria, British Columbia, so I'm uh, three hours off from where Guy is. I spent most of my career in the U.S., but I was born in Canada. Um, I was born in Nova Scotia, the other side of Canada, and my family emigrated to the States when I was three, so I spent uh, most of my career in the U.S., mainly in the Washington, D.C. area, but moved back here about uh, five years ago. We thought it might be a better place for us um, uh, when time comes for retirement, and being a dual citizen, that was an easy thing for me to do. So I now work for the uh, British Columbia Pension Corporation. They administer pensions for the uh, public sector uh, in our province. So it would be like pensions for state government employees or state university employees, municipal employees, things like that. We don't handle the money, we just uh, hmm. handle the, uh, the paperwork, so to speak. And so once again, I'm an instructional designer and my specialty tends to be um, helping people get things done with the business systems that we use, you know, the proprietary pension system and mm -hmm. things like that. Excellent. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to human performance technology or performance improvement? The name has changed, of course, over the decades uh, that you've been associated with that. So, how did you? How did that happen? Well, it was. Uh, there's like a little uh, uh, free sample, so to speak, for that. Uh, in graduate school, I was in an experimental teacher training program. I was going to be a high school teacher. And uh, one of the books that we read was Preparing Instructional Objectives by Bob Mager. Mm -hmm. And it had a big influence on me because I'd wanted to be a teacher all along, and it sort of gave a good guidepost for a high school teacher. You know, what are my real objectives for people learning in a classroom setting? So that was good, and I enjoyed the program. But because of the timing, there were no teaching jobs in my field. I was going to be an English teacher, and when I got into grad school, there really weren't any jobs. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting a job in Detroit working uh, for Amtrak in Ann Arbor, actually, selling train tickets. And that was the basis of my great training. <laughs> and the, fact, the fact that the person who hired me was like me from Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia. So that was the real qualifications. But I informally became the training specialist in my region. I learned how to use our reservation system and would teach it to other people. And about four years later, I got offered a job with Amtrak's corporate training department. And mm -hmm. before they sent me, or before I moved for the job, they sent me to the programmed learning workshop at the University of Michigan. Um, and this workshop had been developed uh, probably six or eight years before by people like Gary Rumler and Dale Rethauer. Mm -hmm. I think Susan Markle had a hand in it. So these are all big, long-time names. They meant nothing to me except that the approach of the uh, lean amount of instruction, of testing people, sort of starting with your criterion items and working backward to see what instructional stuff do you really need as opposed to what do you think you ought to put in mm -hmm. it's a big big influence for me so i kept trying to find this national society for programmed instruction which is how, how it was referred to at the time without any luck and then a short time later the is nspi at the time had a conference in washington dc where i was working um so i went to the conference and that was my real full-blown exposure to a lot of people who were um, giants, rising giants, let's say, in the field then, and have been ever since. Mm -hmm. So that's where you first met then Joe Harless, because I know you have this big connection with Joe Harless, and I remember talking to Joe Harless about you, and he said, oh, Dave's one of the good guys. He really gets it. That Well, that was... Um, 
I have to remember, for me, this was all brand new. I'd never been to a professional conference like this before. I mm -hmm. felt relatively new in the field. I didn't really know what consultants did, for instance. So one of the sessions I went to was a panel discussion on consulting. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, I don't know if you remember Frank Wydra. Oh, right? yes, I, yes. Well, Frank Wydra was the head of Harper Grace Hospital in Detroit. My mom was a nurse and worked at Grace Hospital, so, you know, that connected with me. Another person on the same panel was Stephanie Jackson, um, who was uh, acting in the role of a consultant. And I just found the whole panel very informative and kind of funny. Uh, Frank Wydra was giving reasons for using, he preferred to use internal people rather than consultants because he thought it was a good way to develop his staff. Mm -hmm. and then he gave a couple of reasons why you would use a consultant, you know, time constraints, special knowledge, and he said, also, it's a good idea to use an outside consultant when you're sure that uh, this is a really risky project, so you hire some outside neutral person who shares your bias. <laughs> yes. So after, afterward, you know, as you know, at, uh, at the ISPI conferences, certainly at that time, people were very approachable. So here I am, a new person, and I'm... I can be quite shy at times, but I went up and I was talking with Stephanie Jackson because I'd learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And who comes up but Joe Harless? Now, I'd never met Harless, but I'd already heard his name. This mm -hmm. is a person to be reckoned with. I think he had been a president already at this time. And it's clear that he and Stephanie knew one another. She had worked for him at one point. Right. Turned. So they're kind of talking and catching up, and I'm there. And at one point, Joe says, why don't we go and have a beer? And I started to turn away because it seemed to me like he was saying to his friend and colleague, Stephanie, let's go have a beer. And I wasn't going to impose on them. And I started to move off. And Joe Harless turned to me and said, don't you like beer? <laughs> and so it might have been my first day at the conference. It was certainly the, no later than the second. And I'm sitting in the bar having a beer with Joe Harless and Stephanie Jackson. And as you know, Joe is one of the most gracious people. Mm -hmm. uh, I never saw him at a conference kind of thing really getting impatient with a newbie or anything like that. Um, it was not long after that I took the uh, job aid workshop that he offered and really the, my first exposure to ISPI in general and in particular this kind of thinking transformed me and has stayed with me throughout my career. Excellent. I, I, I share that feeling of those old days, and especially Frank Wydra. I remember at my very first uh, chapter meeting in Detroit, I came from Saginaw with two colleagues, and it's the September after the summer break, first chapter meeting, and everybody is talking about what happened at the very last one before they broke for the summer. And they were talking about how this one guy had stood up uh, and grabbed a pair of scissors and cut the cord on the overhead projector and said, this is bullshit. Let's all reconvene in the bar. And they all got up and left. Well, it was Frank Wydra who had cut the cord, and he confirmed to me this story later on, said he even got a shock from it. He was using the little rounded-edged ed uh, scissors, not the pointed type. And I was telling this story to somebody, and Danny Langdon was there and said... I was the presenter that time, guy, and I was standing there listening to the same story and scared to death that they were going to do it to me. Um, but uh, that uh, Detroit crowd was a, uh, a good entree to the profession, and then meeting people like Joe Harless. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, so because you've been through that Rummler and Breath Hour program and then the Harless Workshop, wh what were some of your other biggest influencers or influences other people or books or articles that you can recall? Well, you know, it's you, you talked a little bit ago about the fact that you and I mostly know one another through social media. Mm -hmm. And so I think about, you know, times like that when social media didn't exist in the same way, but networking did. Right, right. You would right. go to a conference, you'd hear a speaker, or maybe you'd be talking to the person next to you, you'd find people with common interests or common problems, and you would do what you could to stay in touch, and mm -hmm. sometimes really pay back. You know, you could have somebody to bounce ideas off of. It was just much more difficult. You had to do it by email. If you did it by phone, it seemed more intrusive. Mm -hmm. If 
have to be in the same city or something. Maybe you belong to the local chapter and then you could have a very thriving chapter. Um, so that's what those early days were like for me. But a lot of people, um, afterward you connect virtually like this and it works out to be the same thing if you approach it in the same attitude. Mm -hmm. So after having taken... Uh, after having gone to a couple of conferences and taking Joe's um, job aid workshop, I ended up getting approval to take the um, performance analysis workshop that Gary Rumler and um, Tom Gilbert had worked on. Mm -hmm. At that time, Gilbert may have moved on, and I didn't take this directly from Rumler. I took it from one of his staff. But again, it was analytical. Mm -hmm. It was, let's get some data. Uh, the big lesson to me was let's have some data, not just some feelings, and let's look at all of the influence, possible influences on performance, even though I think at the time, my guess would be most people who are active in ISPI were working on something that was more or less an instructional solution. Yes, yes. Because that would be, it's like being in a trauma ward, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm and they're bleeding or they got broken bones or something like that and you address that. There may be some other larger problems. Maybe they're diabetic mm -hmm. and they're coming in bleeding or <laughs> concentrate on that first. Um, so that approach was helpful in, gee, how do I think about where my skills as a training developer aren't going to pay off for anybody? It's not worth my trouble to do this. Mm -hmm. It's not to my client, internal or external, to do this, because this isn't going to solve the real problem. I don't know that I can create big motivational systems. I don't know that I can rejigger how jobs are defined in the workplace, but I can work with uh, people who are systematic about that, people who see things as a process, um, so that certainly was the case with the uh, performance analysis workshop from uh, uh, Rumler and Gilbert. Um, some years later, there was a Making the Most of Your Training, I think was the title, from the Center for Effective Performance ah. down in uh, Atlanta. Gilbert, again, was associated with that. Um, there's a guy, um, Seth something or other, Seth Liebler, yes. was part of that also. Uh, and once again, you know, the... The common denominator of this, you know, various versions of what's in the human performance technology model, mm -hmm. um, lots of different models, lots of different emphasis. If you go up at a high enough level, you know, they're consistent with one another in some way. People specialize in this area, that area. I once tried doing a map of uh, the performance analysis thing uh, as it related to the Six Sigma quality thing that we used when I was at GE, uh -huh. and, you know, I wasn't trying to say Six Sigma is the same thing, but when you're systematic, I think, when you're looking for data, when you can provide rationale for here's why this is a good approach to a tackle this problem, then I think people are systematic in other areas, like engineers, let's say, mm -hmm. like programmers and data people. If they'll listen to you, if they can get out of their box like you get out of yours, I think you can work very effectively with them. By 1980, I was put in charge of a project to develop online training for the brand new Amtrak reservation system. It was still being written. We were working from paper functional specs mm -hmm. to be designing the training for this. and. The little team of uh, people working under me, none of them had an instructional design background, so I was kind of it. But because of the analysis kind of skills that I had been working on and so on, I think we were able to succeed. The IT people were cooperative with us because they saw that we wanted to use the outcomes of the job as kind of... Um, the starting point for what we wanted to do, just like in an IT setting, you talk to the client about what do you want your data to do? What do you want your report to have in it? Not how did it get made? Nobody cares about that except inside IT, that's important. Mm -hmm. But outside IT, 
I want to be able to spot my sales trends. I want to see who my prime uh, contacts are for my next promotion or whatever the heck it is. And the IT people can understand that. The business client loves them. Yes. And, I hope that's what you're looking for. That's yeah, no, thank you. Um, and just let me tie something together for you. That Six Sigma program, which was, of course, created first at Motorola, um, they Motorola bought the intellectual property of Gary Rumler in order to create that program. So it was kind of an amalgamation of all the TQM tools and techniques and the Rumler process orientation and the, and the swim lane process maps. That was important. Um, yeah, so these things all kind of go together, which is really what's kind of cool about that. And uh, the people who take that uh, systematic and systems kind of thinking approach to problems, very influential. Um, so, uh, Guy, as you, as you mentioned this, there is a, an article I read recently, and I'll have to look it up, but I, I'll get back to you. And if I don't, remind me, somebody wrote a uh, piece taking the Agile software methodology and relating it specifically to performance improvement. Uh -huh. And that's a, that's a big thing, like in our organization, we are kind of waterfall-y in uh, how we do our projects. Mm -hmm. We're linear, and they're trying to do more of this agile development. And this is the thing I don't understand all that well, but people I respect, there's uh, Megan Torrance, who's out of Chelsea, Michigan, who has uh, sort of an instructional design model um, she calls LAMA, which stands for something like, looks like Agile methodology. <laughs> <laughs> and, but my, my point there is, you know, there, it doesn't look like it. It's a different way from the traditional ADDIE model of developing things. But this article, and I, the, I'm blanking on the name, uh, was a very good explanation. I sent a copy of it to Megan, who knows agile very well mm -hmm. so she kind of see the human performance technology side mm -hmm. which was uh, an approach she wasn't as familiar with but would not be a stranger to if right. you know what i mean sure sure yeah the people that work in these arenas they they really can see and appreciate the commonalities they they see more of the commonalities i think than the differences that uh, other yeah. people might see let me segue here to um it's, so how do you explain, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, Joe Harless's uh, best friend from the college days, uh, uh, Claude Lineberry, Butch Lineberry, as many of us knew him, uh, he had uh, some fun times at uh, conferences when he read his letter to his mama and where he was trying to explain or she was asking him, you know, what is it that you do? And it's, of course, a big joke inside the profession is how do you explain to others what it is we do? Because it seems to be that it's something that's not easily uh, conveyed. So can you give us your 30-second elevator speech on what it is you currently do? I don't, I don't think I can do anything <laughs> in 30 seconds except count to 30. But... Most of the time when, when people ask that question, they tend to be from outside our field. Mm -hmm. And you know, so it could be a total stranger, it could be somebody else in an organization. And I've been an internal person more often than an external. So when I'm an internal person, I've got some kind of title that usually boils down to training. Okay. My, my new one now, what is, I got a new title, it's um, learning consultant how's that Learning okay consultant. but we're part of our employee services which is our name for hr so they figure we do train and i'm okay with that because people think they know what you mean when you say training mm -hmm. you've got a picture in their mind of the you know relatively formal training often instructor led maybe some online learning they're not as crazy about that as many people in our field are so I will say then, given that long lead-in, which is more than 30 seconds right there, um, within the organization, I work with different groups to figure out whether people need training to solve some problem. There's some, something not happening in the group or the team that they'd like to have happen. New software is coming or they're changing the process or whatever. Do people need to learn things for this or not? 
because I'll say sometimes they don't really need to learn things. Sometimes it's going to be so obvious it's not really a problem. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll be able to get by just fine with some other kind of aid, and then sometimes they really need to learn some new information and practice some new skills. So work with the client to try and decide where we are in that ball of stuff, and if there is a need for some way to acquire skill and knowledge, I'll talk about how can we do it, what would I recommend, given the constraints we have, and here's how we can go about doing those things. And this, this really goes back to, um, going back to Joe Harless, as you know, Joe had a whole series of uh, different kinds of workshops. He had the job aid workshop, he had an instructional design workshop, he eventually developed uh, a front-end analysis workshop. So before we start, how we, can we figure out what kind of problem there is, mm -hmm. how can we make recommendations to move on, and ultimately he ended up with the accomplishment-based curriculum development, the ABCD. And somewhere toward the end of that sequence, he invited a bunch of us who had been certified to give his other workshops to come down and sort of pilot what he had right then, because he wanted to see what we thought about it, and wanted to actively hear our feedback on how this would work. And at one point he said, you know, the way I see this is people would take um, uh, ABCD and first they'd get, and I may get the sequence wrong, but first they'd get the front end analysis stuff. Okay. And then they'd get the, uh, the instructional design stuff and then they would get the job A stuff, blah, 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 go on like that. So that's kind of the way I'm thinking. And you have to understand, you know this, but your viewers, Joe Harless at that point had been working in this field at least 35 years. He had a great reputation. Some people may not have liked his approach, but I'm sure he kept as busy as he needed to and then some. So he didn't need to be tinkering with what he did and experimenting with it, but it was just a natural part of what he was like. How can I do this better? How can I be more effective? So I said to him that in my experience, and there were people who agreed with me, the best approach in a, a corporate organization was first the job aid workshop. Mm -hmm. I could go to the job aid workshop, I could come home, and the next week I could crank out a better job aid for some purpose than I had before. Highly effective, save time in development, save time in delivery, produce results on the job that could not be done without the job aid, yet didn't cost as much as training. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, then whoever your internal client is comes back to you and says, you got any more stuff like that? <laughs> in, in a, in a, in, so to speak. Yeah. So then you could draw on your instructional design skill and you say, hey, yeah, because we could do the job aid stuff. The, the, the analysis that we had to do for, for any kind of training, we had to do that to get the job aid done anyway. Right. So we hadn't lost any time whatsoever. And now we take the, the tasks that we know that couldn't be addressed by job aids, and now let's go and make some training. And where the job aids make sense, we're going to put them in the training, shorten the time there, which means we've got more time left out of whatever your total is, mm -hmm. to practice the skills that you've got to memorize as opposed to the skills that can be, or the knowledge that can be embedded in the job aid. Mm -hmm. the, the example I like to use for this, this is a very dramatic example. Everybody knows the flight 1451 with Sullenberger landing the plane in yes. Europe, right? Yep. Okay, so obviously Sullenberger practiced in training and in retraining emergency procedures with an airplane because you don't want to look up. Do I put the nose up or down? Mm -hmm. Do I tilt that? I don't know anything about flying the plane, but you do a boat. The same kind of thing. You've got to know how to react in emergency in your boat mm -hmm. and not stuff up so there's big and he's rightfully a hero for how he performed but in an interview he talked about jeff skiles who was the first officer and while sullenberger was flying a plane without power skiles was going through the checklist on how to restart an engine that has stopped in flight mm -hmm. that's a checklist yeah it was designed to avoid tunnel vision to make sure you went through all these steps to have only the essential information in it. There was another checklist about landing in the water, but Sullenberger said, we both decided it was more important 
to try and restart the engine that was absolutely the best use of Skiles' time, including one step. I read the entire FAA report. Mm -hmm. There's one step where you push some button and you wait 30 seconds to see if the engine restarts. That's a long time for an engine. So my point there is, that's a very dramatic example of the two sides. Uh, Knowledge that can be, that you don't have to put in the performer's head, that you put into a tool that's easily accessible and easily applied on the job, together with the performance support that says, don't try and remember these steps, Jack. Work through these steps, because it's really important you do them this way. But then we had other skills, which were, oh, we got to have somebody able to steer this plane with no engine. Mm-hmm. And those are, you know, there's no time for uh, reference there, or minimal time for reference. So as much as we can, we want to get those inside the guy's head. So he goes back to in-service training, however often pilots go, and he has all kinds of horrible experiences, because that's what we want them to, to, to rely on. That's that's a really good example of the of the uh, two ends there I think the mm-hmm. combination. So you know, kind of move up the scale in terms of ease of implementation in a client setting. If you're an internal like me, then the benefit to the client and, and the more practical benefit that you've delivered, the greater patience they have for hearing something that otherwise to them might seem more theoretical or just not addressing their problems. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Great stories. Can you talk to us a little bit about where you're currently focusing your own learning as a lifelong learner? What, what's where are you targeting yourself at right now? Well, I'm actually I'm actually thinking about leaving my current position uh, probably by the end of the year and looking around for whatever might be my next opportunity. Um, and I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that would be yet, but I have some, I have some areas that I call bright, shiny objects, (laughs) BSOs in my head. (laughs) It's like things I find interesting and I've decided because they interest me, I should explore that more. So for example, uh, for several years when I lived in Maryland, I was an election judge, which is what they call the people who work in the local voting precinct. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, through Twitter and places like that, I am connected with people who are in the election process world, Mm -hmm. people who see state elections or provincial elections, and there's a lot of opportunities to make things better, a better experience for the voter, a more secure experience for the government body that's conducting the thing. So I think that would be interesting to go to that field and see, could I bring something to that and at the same time learn something from that and benefit from a, you know, a public service point of view. So that's that's uh, uh, one of the bright shiny objects. Related to that, there's a whole um, uh, effort to sort of improve government services in general. How mm-hmm. can we make a, a government website more friendly to the citizens or whatever body of the public comes to that website? Because as you know, the typical government website is just awful (laughs) almost by design you think but not true (laughs) uh, when i lived in the u.s i and i was a consultant for a dozen years independent for a dozen years so i have to file uh, estimated taxes Mm -hmm. i'm sure you've done many times Mm -hmm. and the there's an electronic tax filing system eftps i can't remember what it stands for and it's almost actively hostile to to getting in and telling them, here, take this money. <laughs> so, I'm again, I'm not a developer, but I've worked with developer a long time, and that's a thing that would be kind of interesting to me. Um, there's a third area, which is something probably related to language learning. Mm-hmm. Um, I speak French not particularly well. Um, I learned it in high school. And I didn't use it for years because at my age, it was very hard to uh, practice French in the United States, most places. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, I got involved in Second Life, which was this virtual online world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not it's it's sort of passe now, but 
you create a character and you can move through these worlds. You know, it's like a uh, like a video game, except all the other characters that you encounter are other people in other parts of the world wandering around, and there's hundreds and hundreds of locales, so you can mm-hmm. teleport around, and people do various kinds of things. I ran into a librarian at a virtual library who told me there were regions in Second Life where everybody spoke French. They were basically French-speaking Sims, is what they call the areas, mm-hmm. the simulations. So I started going to a couple of the French-speaking Sims, and you could either do text chat or voice chat. So I started text chatting because I was much more confident in my written French. And they almost all did voice chat, and I made a couple of friends, and they were encouraging me to do voice chat in French. And it was very intimidating, but I got a headset with a mic, and I started doing it. And I tell you what, you go and shoot the shit for an hour, <laughs> three or four times a week, uh, in French with people, and your French gets a lot better. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just, you know, I, there's, no, there's no French in my background, but it's the only other language that I know well enough to converse in. I can sing in Gaelic, but that's, mm-hmm. you know, you'd, you'd be surprised how few calls there are to, <laughs> to sing. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one more, you can edit this out, but this is just the thing that came to me the other day. So I... I sing in Gaelic. I don't really speak Gaelic. I understand some phrases, and I've learned a lot of songs. I'm in a choir here where we sing in Gaelic. Mm-hmm. And all my ancestors were from the highlands of Scotland. My grandparents all spoke Gaelic, and for most of them it was their first language, even in Nova Scotia. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a dying language, but it's, there's people keeping it in life support. So anyway, when you're learning a song in a foreign language, I think that's a really good tool to supplement your language learning. I remember enjoying learning songs in French when I was in school, because what you're getting is, on the one hand, kind of a built-in memorization, right? Mm -hmm. You're learning a song, you're getting this little chunk at a time. At the same time, the individual words are contextualized, so you've got a word in the context of the song, and maybe it's a literal context, or maybe it's a figurative one, Mm -hmm. but that's great, you know, and you you sort of broaden your understanding of the language, I think. So my thought is, wow, I'd like to create a thing where, imagine I had sort of like a vocabulary. So you have a word like hushich, which is the Gaelic word for uh, the past tense of begin. It's began or started or commenced. Mm -hmm. That's the word. But you click on that word and you would get a little definition that says, oh, hushich is the past tense of toshich, which means to begin or to commence. But then you would see a line from a song that has hushik in it, <laughs> and, and, or two or three of those, and it would, it would be Fondalashik uh, uh, la, uh, which is uh, where the day began. So this is a song about somebody out and rowing a boat, and the sun is setting in the west, and he's going to head back, Fondal Hushik de la. Anyway, the, where the day began. I want to get back and start over the cycle. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I don't know anything about programming. And I started asking a few people I know, is this beyond my capability? Or would this be something if I wanted to learn how to code, it becomes my target hmm. to move toward like a practical hands-on exercise so I learn other stuff and I'm patient with other stuff if I see it's going to get me to that point. So there you go. That's, that's uh, too many things. But <laughs> excellent. No, excellent story is great. Um, it, so I, we're, I'm following a script here, of course. And sure. the next thing on uh, my list is there a favorite HPT or performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us because you feel that perhaps the current understanding or use of that term is problematic. Well, you know that I'm pretty biased um, toward job aids. Mm-hmm. I have a website uh, called Ensampler.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a word I picked up from uh, Sivasal and Triagarajam. Mm-hmm. Years ago, in performance uh, and improvement magazine, had they had a, it was a centerfold, and what he all he did was to take some hierarchical information, and he laid it out in about a dozen different ways. 
like an org chart. Okay. And like a outline and like a hub and spoke kind of thing. So it was the same stuff all around, but it looks very different. Mm -hmm. We do that. And Tiavi said, this is an ensampler. And that's a kind of archaic word for example. Mm -hmm. And I liked that so much when I had this idea, I got the domain name, so ensampler.com is mine, <laughs> and I use it specifically as a place to talk about Java. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, that's a resource that people have. But then the definition for job aids, there's lots of different definitions. Um, Joe Harless's quick one was um, uh, a job aid tells you what to do and when to do it. Okay. So Ed, that's okay. Allison Rossett has a very thorough one in her book on job aids, but it's too long to remember. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in the workshop I created, uh, which I call building job aids, I talk about uh, uh, a job aid is information that's external to the performer, used on the job to enable accomplishment and reduce memorization. Now each of those I can elaborate on, and I do when I talk about that, mm -hmm. because to me, and you can see, enabling accomplishment is the key. Mm -hmm. I can been done with this job aid, I can and accomplishment in the Tom Gilbert sense. It's a result that's left there when I go home. Mm -hmm. I can do something worthwhile that I couldn't do without the job aid. You know, and I didn't have to memorize stuff, which I use memorize as sort of a negative word for learning mm -hmm. because I didn't have to memorize this stuff. We have at the Pension Corporation a number of former agreements with other pension plans across Canada. It's like a bunch of treaties between the different parts of the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> and it'd be like a one-to-one -one relationship. We run five different plans, mm -hmm. and there could be a pension plan in New Brunswick that had an agreement with only one of ours. The agreement has been ended for more than 15 years, but there may be people who were qualified for some benefit previously, so they've been grandparented. Mm -hmm. And there's four different kinds of these agreements. So altogether, there might be, you know, if you think of one-to-one -one combinations, we might have more than 200 combinations like that. Mm -hmm. Obsolete. So nobody knows off the top of their head whether you're entitled to this or not. Uh, working with a subject matter expert, I was able to come up with a quick reference that I put into Excel so it could filter by the particular plan on our side. So if somebody says, hey, you know, I used to work for the Alberta teachers prior to 2005, do we have one of the uh, uh, type A agreements? And they could look in the little index and see yes or no. Mm -hmm. And if it's no, it's no. No, nope, they're not qualified for that. If it's yes, then they can turn into the detailed um, description of what are the conditions and what are the benefits and how do you have to do this, blah, 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 blah. Nobody needs to know that stuff and the number of people to whom it pertains, of course, gets smaller every year. Mm -hmm. But the pension corporation, I know that you were former military, so I will tell you that I think it's two years ago now, there was a person who passed away in the U.S. who was very significant, both from the military standpoint and from the pension administration standpoint. This was a woman who was, I believe, in her mid-90s. And the reason it was significant was she was getting a pension of about $127 a month as a survivor of a veteran. She was the last survivor of a Civil War veteran. Mm -hmm. <laughs> her father had apparently been you know, the, the archetypical drummer boy at Shiloh or something. Mm -hmm. like 14 or 15 years old when the Civil War ended, but qualified as a veteran, married very late in life, like in the 1900s, mm -hmm. had this child when he was 80 or something. <laughs> he married a much younger person, and she just passed away. So the pension business, we've got to hang on to this stuff. Yes. Us. That's where the job aid comes in handy. It doesn't use, get used very often. <laughs>
there's no way you can memorize all of it that's for sure well that was a great definition of, of uh, job aids and I think I will go back to the video here and uh, excerpt that and uh, keep that on the wall um, this this next part of this interview is I'm I'm looking for some stories you've you've told us some stories already but um, we talked about this and so if if you've got uh, some additional stories about uh, oh Harless or you, you mentioned that uh, you you got up the nerve to uh, propose to make your first. Um, NSPI uh, conference presentation. Oh, yeah. what, what, share some of the stories from the old days here. We want to keep the uh, those old memories alive. Well, that, that's a favorite one for me. I had um, at that point. This is this is uh, about probably five or six years after I had discovered NSPI at the time through conferences. I mm -hmm. had been to two conferences at the time. I was very impressed with them, very excited, and it was the thing I would have liked to have done. You know, I, I kind of like sharing information. Sometimes I enjoy being in front of people and talking, but the standard to me seemed high. You know, the, a lot of the sessions I went to, I learned stuff. Even if it wasn't pertinent to me, it was worthwhile. It was not just people saying, I'm great. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't necessarily see in my own job at the time much that anybody else would be interested in. Okay. But I kind of pushed myself to say, well, maybe that's not true. Maybe I am misunderstanding what I know. I had spent the best part of a year and a half working on the Amtrak reservation system that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And it was a very traumatic experience for me. I felt overwhelmed much of the time. We used a mainframe-based, computer-based training application, because that's all you could use back then. Mm -hmm. um, and principles I had learned in the program learning workshop six or seven years before really paid off for me, even though at the time people didn't know anything about that kind of computer-based training. And I think we did really a pretty good job with our Amtrak training, and we had gotten better at that. So I thought, well... Not that many people use the system that we use, but maybe I can talk about the approach that we used and how we took advantage of features within a computer-based trading package. Mm -hmm. So I could say, here's the problem that we had, here's what we tried, here's what worked and why we thought it worked, and even if you're not using our system, the commands in the system don't matter. Mm -hmm. If the system's got a capability like this, then I think you can apply it in this area. And I wanted to pitch that mainly to people who didn't know much about computer-based training, of whom there were a lot. Mm -hmm. and so it was like, I'm no expert in this, except I've gone through this, and let me share some of this for you and see what you think. So that was kind of the pitch, and I think the title of my presentation was, we said computer-assisted instruction, I think, at that time. Mm -hmm. So, CAI, your mileage may vary. <laughs> and, you know, as, as the, they accepted the proposal, which was great, and my employer said, yes, you can go, which was great. And I worked, the closer the date got, the more nervous I got, and I was working on this. I practiced in front of my peers. I even timed myself. I had, I literally had in my presenter notes time codes at the end of every page to try and keep myself on track because I was afraid I'd you know, go too far here, mm -hmm. go too far there. Right. So I think I was wandering around the conference the day before my session and I ran into some student who was there, one of those student help us out passes. And she asked what I was speaking about and I told her, oh, I think my professor would like that. I'll be very interested. I'll tell him about it. Maybe he'll want to go. I said, oh, that's that's nice. Where do you go to school? And uh, it turned out her professor was Dale Brethauer. So that's not mm -hmm. what I needed. <laughs> so I, I get to my uh, slot the next morning, and there's someone else who's in the session before me, and they've run over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the conference <laughs> yeah. uh, coordinators didn't get them out of the room. Mm -hmm. right I'm really upset, but I'm, you know, how can I intervene? I'm, I'm, I should have been more assertive myself. But anyway, so they, they get out like 10 minutes late. 
Hmm. And so there's people waiting to get into mine. I got to get myself set up, so I'm starting late. I am just in a tizzy. And I didn't know how many people I expected, but there may have been 70 people in the room. Wow. I was terrified. And smack dab in the center of the first row is Dale Brethauer, whom I recognized from something he did the day before. So I, you know, at that point, you got nothing to do. You know, I launch into my uh, presentation. I had one of my colleagues was there with me, and he said, I could tell when you caught up to your timetable. <laughs> is that obvious? This, this big weight dropped off the shoulders. But I really, you know, I got into what I was talking about. There were a lot of questions and I think because I had this balance, what have I learned and why am I trying to share this with other people? What do I hope they can they take away from that? Mm -hmm. I could feel the questions and say in some cases, look, talk with me afterward, mm -hmm. or I don't want to get into the details of the code for our system because most people are not going to be using this system. Right. But the, the principle is similar, and if you don't have this, you want to look for something that will do the same kind of thing, blah, blah, blah. I was pretty confident in that, even without um, the expertise. And so my, my point there for to people who are in the, the field at all today is, yes, think about your work, reflect on what benefit does this have for someone else. Make a presentation that focuses you on how do I deliver that benefit to somebody else? And when you're done, you too will be at some level, some kind of authority, but much more, you too will be the kind of colleague that people want to have in a field. Mm -hmm. The share information kind of colleague, not the here's a tidbit, now hire me kind of colleague. Right. Excellent. Great story. So do you have any other stories? Any, other, any, any flashes from the past? Well, this is this is a kind of a personal one, so it's um, I don't know how, how useful it will be. I think this was in Los Angeles, but I kind of lose track of which conference was what. Mm -hmm. And I was there on my own. Um, and it was the awards banquet, I guess. And I didn't I hadn't really hooked up with any group to go with, so I was kind of wandering around deciding what to do. And I wandered outside the banquet area. And uh, Joe Harless came up, and of course I know Joe. I knew Joe well enough to say hello. And then Bob Mager came up with Eileen, and then Tom Gilbert came by, hmm. and, and who else was there? One other person, but then that same kind of thing. And so Tom Gilbert told a story about Joe Harless, <laughs> and it was just. You know, I was thinking, I'm here with these people who are big name drop kind of people in the field. Mm -hmm. and, but it's, you know, they were not particularly exclusive. They were just, uh, I think Mager could be a little bit, but uh, they were just kind of hanging out together. And if you were hanging around with them, that was that was okay as far as they were concerned. Mm -hmm. That was, that was kind of a, a small one. Um, oh, I guess the other one, I did a really big uh, project with GE um, when I worked there. Um, we had a client with a 2,500 person strong sales force. They were getting laptop computers for the first time. The client was automating their paper-based sales process. And their salespeople were all going to get a new laptop it would have this new custom application that was being built for the client on it. They were gonna get their email through uh, the GE division that I worked for. Mm -hmm. We were behind Apple Talk. We really, we really had a great email system at the time. Sometimes uh, clients would ask me, is this really good? I mean, everyone takes email for granted now. They say, is this really good? And I would say, you know, we can't always tell you who our clients are. Mm -hmm. But in this one instance, I can tell you a story to help you understand the one client we have who is so big that no matter where you have lived in your life and no matter where you have vacationed in your life, our client had a local office somewhere near you. I'm not going to tell you who the client is, but there was a report in the newspaper, so I will tell you that the client's headquarters 
is in Vatican City. <laughs> our Italian subsidiary sold our email system to the <laughs> Vatican. <laughs> so, if you ask me, is this a good email system, <laughs> I can ask you, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> excellent, excellent. Let me, let me ask you a question about uh, a blog post that you did back in 2008. I went and reread it this morning um, because when you had posted it, I shared it with the leadership of ISPI. And you were lamenting the demise of chapters and you were expressing some of your frustration in the, uh, you, you know, every 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 change in the administration, I experienced this myself, required everybody to start over from scratch, reinvent the wheels, and as you put in there, do we even need, do we need an axle to go with this new wheel that we've just reinvented? I don't, I don't remember the axle. <clears throat> but um, so, so um, let's talk a little bit about that. So things had been changing enough by 2008 that uh, the use of social media and getting your information and insights from others didn't require going to annual conferences, didn't require going to chapter meetings, um, and you made the comment in this blog post that as people advanced and became a little bit more sophisticated, it was harder to find something that would appeal to everyone in the chapter other than the base core stuff, which appealed to the new people coming in, but not necessarily to the people who had been around there for a little while. So. What's your take on that whole um, issue of affinity groups, such as an ISPI and local chapters? Um, is it dead and dying and almost gone and soon will be, or is there some uh, utility in in chapters in professional organizations? Yeah, that's a that's a really that's a big question. Um, I am very conscious of the good fortune I had at the time I came into the field before I really was getting paid as an instructional designer I got sent to that workshop at the University of Michigan so mm -hmm. right away I had gotten introduced to thinking that was consistent with the whole human performance improvement kind of model within four years after that I'd taken the job aid workshop I'd gone to conferences and I was in the middle of a bunch of people who thought in ways consistent with that approach, obviously different for, for um, individuals. And in Washington, D.C. at the time, there was a thriving ISPI chapter. The Potomac chapter may have had more than 100 active members at that time. Mm -hmm. Those numbers dwindled over the years. Um, and let's see. I, it's it's hard for me to find the timing, but once I left um, GE, uh, it was even at GE it could be difficult to get the organization to send a person to a professional conference, yeah. like the ISPI conference. And there's you know there's I think of the you, you've got conferences and then you've got other forms of professional development. So the conference is the big smorgasbord. Mm -hmm. right? That's, Right. It's kind of like your undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. You go there and there's there's the tracks and so on, but this it's a wide table full of stuff. <coughs> You've got much more specialized things. Somebody's three day seminar, whatever it might be, where you're honing in on some particular area, building a depth of skill. But both of those things take a lot of time and a lot mm -hmm. of money. Mm -hmm. And I think organizations were having a harder and harder time making that happen for people. It got more, more difficult for me as time went by. And if you're an individual practitioner, as I was for a dozen years, that's real money. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if your <clears throat> practice is such that your margin is 25%, as a consultant said to me one time, mm -hmm. and if you need $1,500 to go to a conference, you need $6,000 worth of business to pay for that. Right. And, you know, that's just a really big challenge. So that model of go away to conference is tough. And if that's your primary vehicle for networking, you're already in trouble. Mm -hmm. If the well, chapter begins to fade for whatever reason because people are getting their needs met elsewhere, 
Um, that's the second thing. Washington, D.C., there's tons of training and development people, but the change of uh, the way people live meant that people didn't want to come back to some central point at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night mm -hmm. to do whatever it was they were going to do. I um, was approached, I can't remember the exact time, but somewhere in the mid-2000s, to, uh, I was asked if I would be considered being the uh, new president of the chapter. And what turned out is that nobody from the prior board was open to this. So we didn't have a pr vice president, mm -hmm. uh, vice elect kind of thing. Um, I agreed, but I had not been an officer in a long time. I was secretary once several years before, but I, I don't think leadership skills are my, are my strong suit. So we took a look. I got a spreadsheet about the previous year's program. So who came to the programs? How much money do we make? Blah, blah, blah. And one of the things I looked at was, gee, all these board members come to the programs. So I subtracted the board members out. And in some cases, we had eight people other than the board. Uh -huh. Thinking, why are we putting the effort into finding a venue, finding a speaker, blah, 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 when only eight people are going to come? Now, some of the longtime people were unhappy because we were getting away from the dinner meeting kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure experience those, right? You go to some meeting room, they got some kind of light dinner from the hotel, you, so you get a real meal and you get the program. Well, we couldn't possibly afford that. And so I was thinking, what's the trade-off here? What's the value here? It was a very um, disappointing experience for me on the, on the local chapter level. Then I looked to the national organization, and my view was constrained because I had not been to national conferences in a few years. But it seemed to me that there were some people in the discussion that you talked about, they didn't want to move off email. Mm -hmm. There were essentially some, uh, I don't mean this too disparagingly, but you've got some person who's been a tenured college professor for 22 years, and he's comfortable in his email streams. At that point, uh, in 2008, I had been on Twitter already for close to a year. I had had two blogs. One was personal, one was professional. My oldest professional blog is probably 12 years old now. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm not an IT guy. Yeah. But I learned that, you know, for me, the blog was, uh, as Harold Jarkey from New Brunswick says, it's my way of thinking out loud about problems that interest me. It's not my big idea of the day. I have weeks when I don't have a big idea. But if I was interested in something, I could write a blog post about it. It would help me to clarify my thinking. And by putting it up there, if someone came across it, they could share the idea or react to it. The single smartest thing I ever did on the blog, and this is, I'm wandering here, so um, there's a book called 10 Steps to Complex Learning by two Dutch professors. Uh, Norman von Marienbohr and uh, Paul Kirshner. And I had read an article by them a year or two before. It's really heavy going. They write in a very dense style. Mm -hmm. But it's very good stuff in there, and I won't go into it in detail. But the book came out, and I thought, I really enjoyed that article. I'm going to get this book. I got the book, and I literally had to get a little spiral-bound notebook and make notes to myself as I work through every chapter, because that was the only way I could process it all. Mm -hmm. and note is a good learning uh, strategy. So I was making all these notes in my little notebook, and I can't remember how many pages I had, and I thought, well, this is, what am I gonna do with this? And I thought, all right, I will take this first batch, which was just, I think, the introductory chapter, and I'm going to retranscribe these notes, and I'm going to make a big blog post about it. Mm -hmm. And again, this is for me. It's clarifying my thinking. And so I took my handwritten notes, I transcribed, I expanded, whatever I did, and I put this post on that says, you know, here's what I'm doing. I'm taking these notes, I'm reprocessing here. I think this stuff is really useful, and I'm writing it up here because that gives me a second chance. So it looks like I've started a series of posts. Yes. Ended up writing 21 blog posts about the 10 steps of complex learning. But what I found was people who I admired, even, 
thanked me for doing this. And in some cases, they were saying, I'm not going to read that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saving me the time. But, you know, the principle there was, this was learning for me. This was mm-hmm. sharing for me. This is a way of connecting. What if you're, you're not going to do that in email? Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you know, you're not necessarily going to support that central thing. I don't know what the answer is. I think there's always going to be a role for the uh, professional society kind of thing. There's probably already always going to be some kind of role for, you know, come to the conference and learn stuff. Right. The e-learning guild has done an excellent job mm-hmm. in its areas. In fact, they were the ones who um, uh, agreed to let me conduct my own job aid uh, session, the Building Job Aids Workshop. Mm-hmm. I did it their dev learning conference in 2015 and I was delighted to do that it's really a little bit tangential to their main focus which is online learning but I got to do that so you know in the past 10 years most of my professional contacts have been uh, virtual ones right you find out about same site events so to speak like dev learn or ISPI or something like that and then you have to see, what can I afford to go to? Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you that if they had not accepted my workshop, I might not have been able to go to Dev Dev. Mm-hmm. Um, I went and did the workshop again a year later in Toronto, and I, I they gave me the conference fee was waived because I was a presenter, but I had to pay my own transportation right. because I couldn't get my organization to do it. Mm-hmm. And I, faulting them necessarily but that was the reality it was important enough for me to do but i can't do that every year you know i'm not right there. yeah without the corporate uh, sponsorship as that used to be back in the 70s and 80s uh, that's i mean that's all gone away it's made it uh, cost prohibitive but you mentioned devlearn and there are organizations that have grown tremendously over the time that others have shrunk yeah. um and is it because the growing organizations have somehow appealed to the newer, younger generations, or is it all generations? It's just they're on the leading, bleeding edge of technology and the application of uh, instructional technology to, uh, along with the uh, uh, hardware and software kinds of uh, uh, evolution. I don't want to pose myself as an expert on this because I'm, I don't think I am, but. Here's my notion. I think, uh, from what I know, the e-learning guilds kind of thing. So the e-learning guild specialty is sort of online learning in mm-hmm. various forms. Okay, so as obviously appeals to a lot of relative newcomers and people who don't have a great deal of skill. How can I come and get better at what I'm doing? Okay, and it's it's sort of broad based. They're not pushing any one particular platform. They're just getting together people of interest. So you go there, and even if you're a novice, you find out stuff. You know, it's kind of like ISPI in you know 30 years ago, and how to tackle training problems. So mm-hmm. you did learn how to tackle training problems, and you got awareness of what's not a training problem. Mm-hmm. In the same way that uh, uh, Articulate, the people who make storyline software, there's a uh, e-learning blog by Tom Kuhlman. Mm-hmm. Yes. And if you go to Tom Kuhlman's blog and you read it, you could use 90% of what he has in there with Lectora, with Captivate, with any other kind of e-learning program, including one you were building in your basement. Mm -hmm. Because Tom Kuhlman is very big on how do I present this information, what's my strategy for this information, here are some productivity tips that you could adapt to whatever tool you use. Mm So that's that's an example of, you know, that's a great resource for people. And DevLearn and, and um, um, Learning Solutions, which tends, uh, tends to be in Florida, I think, you know, they've, they've got levels of expertise so you can expand your skills. So they've got a, I think of this kind of thing like a fence. We've got a fence that stuff fits into. Like in my blog, mm-hmm. my fence is learning and performance and brain stuff and I have a little corner that I allow for side trips and I try to keep it from getting too big. Um, I think ISBI has often suffered from a, you know, the, the research is important and the, and the uh, origins are important, 
but sometimes they're not very pragmatic. Okay. And uh, I remember Claude Lineberry at a at a local chapter presentation in Washington um, saying essentially no corporation is going to pay for controlled tests. Mm -hmm. They don't have you do a course and have one group of people be the control group and right. the other group not be the control. Yeah. You know, if that looks like it works, it works. That's they're they're okay with that. They mm -hmm. want to move on, get something else done. And I don't think he meant that absolutely literally, but it's very, very true. Oh yes. You know? So you wanna you wanna have as much useful theory as you can. Heavens knows if you go to a conference like uh, the ATD or the Canadian equivalent, which is the Inf Institute for Performance and Learning, you still get people pushing learning styles, you get people pushing Myers-Briggs, you get people pushing uh, um, uh, neuroscience kind of learning. Right. As if, you know, I don't think there's anything worthwhile in learning styles, but I'm also not going to argue learning styles with people because they don't want to hear it right. anyway. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so, you know, that you're, you're never going to escape that. Research could maybe cure that, but you can't go around and proselytize people into research as easily as you can, I think. Um, like Twitter. You're on Twitter, I'm on Twitter. I was uh, slow to adopt Twitter at first. I think in my first six months, I sent 63 tweets. I counted it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've learned how to use it as a tool for me. I don't go around telling people, you should learn Twitter. But I remember having a conversation once, just a random one, some uh, place I was, a restaurant, a lot of people, not a restaurant, a cafeteria, a lot of people looking for a place to sit. There was a younger woman looking around. I said, you know, you're welcome to sit here at my table if you want. So she sat down, we chatted for a while. She was a mechanical engineer. She had just moved to the DC area um, in part because of her husband's job or something like that. It was a decision that they had made. She had found a job for herself, but she, I don't really know very many people in the mechanical engineering field. Mm -hmm. so I talked about Twitter a bit. I forget how it came up. And I said, you know, I follow a lot of people on Twitter. She was much younger than me, didn't know anything about it. Um, I said, you know, if you're willing to give me your address, because I didn't have a smartphone at the time, I'll go home. I'll look up to see if I can find anything about mechanical engineers on Twitter. And what turned out, I, I googled that, mechanical engineers on Twitter. So that's not a really <laughs> hard-thinking search. Mm -hmm. And I found this big old list of mechanical engineers on Twitter of various sorts. So I sent her the information, said, you got to go in here and look and see. You can look up a person. Here's how you look up a person. Mm -hmm. See what she says. Is this stuff you're interested in or not? Are they in your area? or in your specialty within mechanical engineering, whatever that is. So the idea there is, she had a need. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be connected with more mechanical engineers than I am. Okay, how can I find some mechanical engineers? Well, one way is ask your friends who are engineers, but another way is go on something like Twitter, or go on something like LinkedIn, and with Twitter, you could then just look at them and see what they're saying. Mm -hmm. I think that guy's a mechanical engineer, but all he talks about is football. Okay, fine. He can mm -hmm. have fun. But here's a mechanical engineer, and it's another woman, and she works in this geographic area. You know, she's close to me. Maybe I want to find out about that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe this one works in some field I'm interested in. That's the do-it-yourself kind of thing, which is really, I think, just a modern version of what you did at the conferences all along. And what we did at the local chapters as well. I'm looking for local, your local network. Yes, your local network sometimes was not very good, you know, or the people in it didn't seem to be too good. So mm -hmm. you could try new people in, or you could try and model something. I just think it's it's a much harder thing to sustain. Um, and I, I didn't have any hostility toward ISPI, but uh, I was a certified performance technologist. I was in the first batch. Mm -hmm. And I stayed in for, I don't know, six years, nine years, and quite frankly, no one had ever asked me about it outside of ISPI mm -hmm. once, and I decided, you know, actually there's another ISPI person, I said something to this about, he says, I think of it as just you know, giving a little cash, extra cash back to the society. <laughs> 
which, which is fine. Right. But I do that now with apps that work for me. Mm -hmm. I use Evernote all the time. I am on whatever paying level it is with Evernote. I don't begrudge them the 60 bucks a year, whatever it is I pay them, because I get my $60 benefit out of it. So for the price of whatever per year the, the um, CPT would have done for me, I could be um, sustaining three or four applications that are worth it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the new modern way. I mean, the technology... The, what I like about the advent of the new technologies is that makes things such as uh, what uh, Rumble, Rumbler and Gilbert called guidance and what Joe Harless called job aids and what Gloria Gary called performance support. It's now enabled the ubiquitous tools that we have and uh, it serves us in many, many, many different ways, um, directly or indirectly by the connections we can make. Well, and in addition to that, just as in the old days, uh, there's a there's a guy who commented on when Web 2.0 was a big thing, a guy named Clay, Clay Shirky, and had a book called Here Comes Everybody, and he was talking about this world of new tools and stuff like that, and he says, people say, oh, it's just too much, you know, there's too much information flowing at you, and so he used the analogy of walking through a food court, mm -hmm. like a mall or something, right? So you're going through the food court with your lunch, and over here there's a bunch of businessmen who have businesses of some sort at the at the mall that you're at, and they're talking about inventory or whatever the hell they're talking about. And over here there's a bunch of high schoolers, and they're yakking about what they're doing as they're shopping. And over here there's a family, and over here there's some people talking about something else. Now you can hear all these conversations, said Shirky, but they're not talking to you. So people in the baby boomer generation, we grew up in the era of broadcast media. So you mm -hmm. turn on the television, in a sense, television is talking at you. Mm -hmm. It's broadcast, right? You turn on the radio, and the radio is talking to you. And if you don't want to hear the sports program, you tune the radio to where you find somebody who does. Well, in the, in the social media world, you've got to create your own filters. And just because there's a bazillion people on Twitter doesn't mean they're talking to you. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to listen to them if you don't want. Don't follow them. Right. Set up your own filters. Follow the people you want to follow. But recognize this is a continuous conveyor belt of thoughts and ideas and facts and notions. And you can't just sit there all day and read it. You've got to kind of curate it. And if something is important, even in the groups that you're connected to, it'll probably come back. Heated mm -hmm. or, or reemphasized or elaborated on. And the other thing that I find useful for that kind of thing is following people who are completely outside my field. Mm -hmm. I follow a scientist whose specialty is nanotechnology. I follow a rabbi. Um, I follow... I actually got a little uh, uh, ongoing writing gig from a person in a European country who contacted me because of my blog and my Twitter handle mm -hmm. and asked me if I would do that. There's a person in the training and development field who approached me the same way for a small project in part because they saw both how I write and how I treated ideas on my blog and they had something they wanted to sort of get my opinion on and were willing to pay for that just to get that so you know if i was only in publications as would have been the case 20 years ago right that would be the only place you could find me now it's in a lot of opportunity and i'm frankly baffled by somebody who's a working professional like you or me who is not tied into people in some way other than email mm -hmm. yeah no, I'm not, but I'm not the, but there are some. Oh well, yeah, I'm not telling them how to live their life. But if you're if you are a a professional in almost any sense of the word, and you think Twitter is where people say I had a ham sandwich for lunch, mm -hmm. you're not a very imaginative person. <laughs> You've looked at the wrong tweets. Yes. Well, I I agree. Um, do you, so let me kind of bring this close to a close. Um. 
parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience related to performance improvement. What would you suggest to people that are new to the biz? I'm, I'm trying to think of, um, you know, for people who are new to business, if they if, if they really are not in the instructional design field much, mm -hmm. um, or if they're a client especially, I think the book that I have recommended most to people is Bob Mager's What Every Manager Should Know About Training. Mm -hmm. uh, you can read that book in about two hours. Because it's written in a very easy conversational mm -hmm. style. Yes. And what Maker does is start off with this goes back to what we talked about a little while ago the idea of training in a corporate or organizational setting. Everybody kind of has a generalized picture of what it looks like, even if it's dreadful. Mm -hmm. But they have some idea. So Maker starts with that because that's what the client is thinking about. Okay, so what are training needs and what are we trying to get done? Blah, blah, blah. And what he does is smuggle in the whole performance improvement process without really necessarily calling it that. Mm -hmm. So I have said to people who don't know very much about what we do, if they're really curious, uh, I've actually given copies to clients that I've gotten along well with. I mm -hmm. say, think that, you know, I've done you uh, good with this project that is on. It's because of the way that we've collaborated together. And I think you might find some of the thoughts in here worthwhile. And I think somebody who reads what's in that can turn to others' training solutions and recognize good from bad pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Is this tied to some real organizational goal? Do we have any uh, evidence that this is right? Um, the other thing that I often talk about, um, are, uh, it's a, it goes back to another Joe Harless thing, and I'm sure you're familiar with this already, uh, Joe said one time, there's a question you never want to ask your client. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the question you never want to ask your client is, what do you want people to know? And I can actually hear, hear Joe's voice in my head. It says, the reason that you don't want to ask them what do you want people to know is, they'll tell you. <laughs> and it'll be history of widgets and great moments in widget making and widget makers I have known and appreciation of widgets. And of course, the right question is, what do you want people to do? And when I tell this to clients of my own, I emphasize do in the accomplishment sense more than the behavior sense. Mm -hmm. What do you want people to get done? What do you want to have left behind when they go home at the end of the day Start with that. I used to say working backwards, and I'm trying now not to not to say backwards. Okay. So you start with that accomplishment. That's where you begin, and then you work with that to say what influences those accomplishments. So they need some information. They need some skills. They need some tool. Blah blah blah. Can anybody do this now? Blah blah blah. And once you identify a bunch of needs that stand in the way of those supports for the accomplishment that you had, then you turn to those needs and say, how do we address that need? And whatever you're doing, you're working with the client and saying, this is the need that we saw based on, this is what you wanted, and this was what's in the way, and I think this and this and this and this will do that. What do you think? It's a lot easier to agree on the outcome than it is to agree on the steps first. Yes, excellent. So those are, those are, you know, those are two simple kinds of things. You know, two questions and a book you can read in two hours. But, uh, you know, once you've read that book uh, of Mangers, you're ready for a lot of other stuff that is consistent with that. Um, uh, the Robinsons uh, from uh, Training to Performance is a good example of that kind of thing. But almost any book in our field really has that as kind of a touchstone, I think. Mm -hmm. Just yes. various, even even Rumbler stuff, which is very heavy duty, um, managing the white space in the organization, Rumbler and Braish, mm -hmm. um, uh, what's the other one? No, Serious Performance Consulting, right. which is much less known. But down underneath all of those is, what's the organizational goal? What do we have to understand about the organization and people in it? 
what are the influences, blah, blah, blah. And as you know, Rumbler said probably 80% of on-the-job performance problems are not due to a lack of skill or knowledge. And so you ain't going to train your way out of a bad work design problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. That's an excellent advice on that uh, Maker book, what every manager needs to know about training. Um, well, let me bring this to a close by thanking you for spending this time with me and doing this. I will put your um, your contact information in the uh, slides that go along with the video that will be posted and uh, okay. share that, and hopefully people will uh, make their way to Dave's whiteboard, the name of your blog. Um, I appreciate uh, all that you've shared over the uh, this decade plus that uh, I've known you better on uh, via social media. Um, but again, thank you so much for your time today. Okay, thank you very much, Clyde. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.